All right, hang tight, everyone. We're going to get started a few minutes after the hour. We're just letting people into the call right now. All right, class, if you want to pause the music, we will get started. Welcome, everybody. My name is Evan Clark, I'm Executive Director of Atheists United here in Los Angeles. Uh, thank you for joining us from all over the world. We've had some of these video meetings with people from four or five continents at the same time. So if you'd like to share where you're joining us from, go ahead and put that in the comments below. We'd love to uh, hear where everyone is attending from. If you're not a member of Atheists United, I really, really, really could use your help. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but we're in a bit of a, a economic crisis caused by a global pandemic right now, and uh, we could really use your support. One of the best ways to support our organization is to become a member. Um, members get access to wonderful events like these, along with our uh, newsletter. Normally, we have a lot more in-person events that serve members across California. We've moved all of those online and are now hosting over 250 events a year online across our network of groups. And uh, if you'd like to support that, either give a donation or um, go ahead and become a member today. We used to raise over $250 every time we had an event like this, and that just got completely wiped out. So anything you can give really helps support us today. I have some short announcements, and then we're going to get started, and uh, just thank you for your patience. So our next speaker is actually this Thursday. We'll be hosting uh, Sarah Galuli from Americans United for Separation of Church and State. Uh, they'll be speaking on how to use letter writing to fight, church state, fight for church-state separation. This is a new speaker series that we're offering at Atheist United. So if you're, if you're keeping count, which I know uh, most of you aren't, but if you are keeping count, we now have three speaker series that we're offering. So there's this one. This is on our fourth Sundays that we've been doing since 1982 that we're experiencing today. Uh, in 2020, we launched a new pop-up speaker series. Uh, this was designed more for speakers coming through LA that we we're looking to host that were off schedule for us. Uh, we've moved that online and have been bringing in more and more interesting speakers from uh, all types of backgrounds and expertise. And then this new program we're calling Supercharging Secular Leaders, and it's actually a leadership development speaker series to try to help you become better activists and help us upgrade our communities. So we'll be kicking it off with a uh, vice president of Americans United for Separation of Church and State. Look forward for some really interesting speakers on this series. I uh, can't wait to announce some that we're uh, working to organize right now. Again, that's Thursday at noon if you're able to join us on Zoom. I want to quickly mention our end of year fundraising that I've been mentioning for the, the last two meetings. Uh, we had a $20,000 goal, which we knew was ambitious and beyond anything we had raised at the end of the year in a long time. Uh, we're about 35% of the way with that goal and we've continued it. We're continuing it throughout the winter. 
Um, so if you'd like to help us reach our $20,000 goal, we'd love your $10,000 checks. You can uh, mail them or uh, go online. Uh, I understand that times are tough for many of you, but if you're in the lucky position where you can get a stimulus check, uh, if everyone can mute themselves, I would highly appreciate it. Um, if you get a stimulus check that you're not sure what to do with the money because you're doing so well, we want to be one of those charities you consider. Um, that's from a previous presentation that accidentally snuck in. I'm about to announce Chris, but before I do, I want to quickly mention uh, these fourth Sunday speakers we do also align with our uh, member meetings. So as a member organization, um, our members are the governing body that elect our board. And uh, we have a open meeting for them at the end of each one of our speaker meetings. Uh, Klaus, one of our board members who likes to call himself the godfather of fun, will be having a hereafter party for us if anyone would like to join. Um, it's just kind of hang out and chat for a while after today's presentation. Um, we also have some quick official business we're going to have to do. Uh, our board had a, uh, a position vacated recently and the board elected um, uh, Greg Shields to the position of treasurer and we need approval from the membership on that and so we'll do some small official business real quickly with our chair Christine Jones and then we'll uh, move into the hereafter party so just want to quickly go over that. If you have any questions uh, for today's meeting um, for our Q&A section or questions in general about how we do our meetings go ahead and put those in the chats. Um, I'll be facilitating the Q&A after our speaker presentation and we want to make sure uh, we keep that orderly as much as we love you and want to hear from you, we really don't want to hear from 20 of you on the same microphone at the same time. So please keep yourself muted throughout this presentation. And uh, if you have trouble with that, we will gladly mute you for you. Um, but we expect this to be a great presentation and your participation in keeping yourself muted and putting your questions in the chat is one way to help with that. With that, let's get started. I'm going to read a quick bio and introduction of uh, good friend Chris Stedman. So happy to have him speak. Uh, he's been published an incredible book a few years ago, has another one that just came out, has been doing incredible work across the humanist community for years, and it's a thrill to host him. Uh, Chris is a Min Minneapolis-based writer, speaker, and community organizer. He's the author of IRL, Finding Realness, Meaning, and Belonging in Our Digital Lives and Faithius, which was published in 2012. Chris has appeared on CNN, MSNBC, PBS, and has written for publications including The Guardian, The Atlantic, BuzzFeed, Pitchfork, Vice, USA Today, and many, many more, including the LA Review of Books out here in LA. Previously, he's the founding director of the Yale Humanist Community and a fellow at Yale University. And Chris has also served as humanist chaplain at Harvard University currently teaches in the Department of Religion and Philosophy at Augsburg University and serves as the network of ELCA colleges and universities 2020 to 2021 visiting lecturer. I'm gonna mute that person. All right, with that, let's officially give a warm welcome. You can give your snaps and fingers and excitement towards uh, Chris Stedman, our speaker today. With that, Chris, I will get rid of this screen share and let you take over. Uh, stop sharing. Great. Uh, hey, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you, Evan, for that very kind introduction. Um, so, okay, uh, I'm here to talk about how the internet has shifted our understanding of what it means to be human. But um, as you may have heard uh, in, or as you just heard in my introduction, I am sort of professionally, my background is as a humanist community builder. And my first book was on atheism and interfaith dialogue. And so if you're wondering sort of what the connection is between those dots, um, I, I guess I want to start by sort of explaining how I ended up writing a book about the internet, because that was not what I um, expected that I was going to do. So um, back in 2016, I left my position as a professional humanist community builder. I was directing an organization called the Yale Humanist Community. And um, I, I just, sorry, noticed in the chat, someone asked about the sh shirt. Here you go. <laughs> I'll show you the full thing uh, there. Sorry, sometimes I actually, I wear this sweatshirt so often that I forget that it has um, not just text on it, but text that might be attention grabbing. So apologies for the distraction. Um, 
Anyway, so back in 2016, I left my day job as a humanist community builder and came back to Minnesota, the state I grew up in. And there were a few reasons for that. Um, one of them was very personal. My stepdad was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and I moved back to help um, my mom take care of him. So I, I was a caregiver for my stepdad uh, for the last few years. Um, I also sort of always wanted to come back to Minnesota. All of my family stayed here. Um, but uh, I also, you know, having worked for the better part of a decade as a humanist community builder, I was beginning to ask myself some questions about, um, you know, how that, you know, could be best done and, and sort of what the needs of the population that I've been trying to serve um, for the, that last decade um, really were. And so um, I ended up moving back and uh, started working with some humanist and secular groups here in Minnesota um, that were interested in opening a center for humanist life. So they kind of, they wanted to explore what it would look like for these various atheist, humanist, secular groups in Minnesota to kind of come together under one roof and coexist in the same physical space. And when we started having that conversation, I came back to them and said, you know, I am definitely interested in this project and I think there's a lot of value in the idea, but I also think having worked um, in this field now for a number of years that um, I, I have some questions about, um, you know, the sort of way that at least the groups that I've been a part of have gone about trying to serve this non-religious population. And, you know, rather than sort of, you know, trying to open a center and see, you know, how that would work, I, I, I suggested that maybe we could try um, taking a kind of community organizing approach and say, you know, let's do a sort of very thorough assessment of the needs of this population first. And so um, they were interested in that idea. And so for the last few years now, I've been working with a group of sociologists at the University of Minnesota and UMass Boston to do a study on the lives of the religiously unaffiliated. That, so we started by doing a sort of survey of the existing research to see what was out there. And then we designed a survey, which I've learned now is a very long, complicated process. Um, a lot of uh, things go into that process that I had no idea about. Um, I've learned a great deal from working with them. Um, and this survey has, um, our goal for the survey was to try and get a much sort of richer understanding of where religiously unaffiliated people are currently finding meaning in their lives. So what kinds of practices help them make sense of sort of big questions in their life, big events that they experience? Where are they currently getting a sense of community and identity from? What does community even mean to them? What do they expect to give to a community? What do they expect to get out of being in a community? And so we designed the survey, we put it through some various sort of tests. Um, we ended up you know, going through a really long process to seek funding for it. You probably won't be surprised to learn that um, trying to fund a study uh, that's about religion can be really complicated. And then trying to fund, fund a study that's about religion, but also specifically about non-religious people narrows the field of who's interested in supporting that even more. <laughs> so, um, but we did come out on the other side, um, getting to do a sort of first run of the survey and we've been processing what we found. Um, and throughout that process, one of the things that I started noticing was that a lot of the people who have left religious institutions, um, especially in the last 10 years in the United States are moving the work that they used to do within religious spaces to digital space. So rather than going to church to forge meaningful connections, to learn more about the world around them, to process sort of major events in their lives, um, they're sort of going online to do a lot of those things. Um, and that was one of the things that we ended up asking about in the survey. And um, we have a paper um, coming out on that relatively soon. Um, and so that was one of the things that sort of made me become a little more interested in this book was, um, you know, and, and this was something I noticed sort of anecdotally in my own work as a humanist chaplain over the years was that, you know, many of the people that I was working with were, um, you know, turning to the internet for 
larger and larger sort of parts of their lives, um, more and more of the ways that they sort of situated themselves in the world and understood themselves were happening in digital space. And so I wanted to understand how, get a better understanding of how that sort of impacted um, the ways that we find sort of a sense of meaning and belonging in our lives. Um, and then the other reason I ended up writing this book was a more personal one, which was that as I was, as I sort of left that position at Yale and came back to Minnesota, um, I went through a period of sort of you know, a number of major personal changes happened to me in sort of quick su succession. So my career changed really quickly. My long-term relationship ended. Um, I, you know, sort of moved back to my home state after many years living far away from my family. And so as I was going through all of this change and transition, I started to notice a tension in my own digital life, which was that I felt, I, I noticed myself sort of continuing to post online as if it was just sort of business as usual to sort of continue sharing the things that I thought were appropriate or safe to share online and feeling like there were other sort of things that I was experiencing that I wasn't sure if I could share online. Um, and so anytime I sort of feel a tension in my own life, I'm always, that's always the thing that I sort of want to dig into. And so anyway, as a result, I ended up um, spending the last um, several years doing a fair amount of sort of digging into this question of how the internet is influencing our understanding of, um, of who we are. And, and so that looked like a number of things. Um, I did a lot of reading and research. I did a great deal of interviewing. So I talked to a lot of people about what their experience of online life has been like. Um, I reflected on my own experiences. Um, I uh, and then and then I ended up doing also a lot of research in in sort of more unexpected places. Um, I spent a lot of time at the University of Minnesota's map library, trying to understand how cartographers sort of map complex three dimensional terrain and reduce it into something two dimensional, and um, and how that's a process of sort of selection. Right, they have to choose what they're representing on the map and what they're leaving off because they can't include every detail on the map or the map would be the size of the territory they're attempting to map. Um, and and uh, you know, I wanted to get a better understanding of that in order to understand better the ways that we sort of map ourselves online and the, the kind of selection process that we um, experience when deciding you know, making decisions about what we share about ourselves and our experiences online and what we leave out. And one thing I learned during that process was that these choices that map makers make um, aren't sort of neutral decisions, right? They're not just sort of choosing at whim what to include on the map and what not to. Those choices are guided by con the conventions of cartography and the conventions of cartography are shaped by the interests of the powerful. So who pays for the maps? Whose vision of the world, it determines whose vision of the world is reflected in those maps. Um, and similarly, there are many sort of conventions that shape our online experience that are um, sort of shaped by the interests of those who, who fund and, and have built the platforms that we use to express ourselves and connect with others. Um, so I ended up spending a great deal of time trying to sort of look in other fields to get a better understanding of, of sort of parallels we might draw to our digital experience. Um, and so, you know, because more and more people, especially young people, are moving their search for meaning and belonging out of the institutions in which we've historically grappled with those kinds of things like um, religious con contexts and doing those sort of more individually and increasingly online. Um, I, yeah, I wanted to sort of understand how that's shaping, um, especially in a sort of increasingly secular age, how that's shaping our understanding of who we are. So I started this process feeling, I would say more sort of split as I suggested based on my own individual experience. Um, you know, when it comes to, you know, there's a lot of commentary on the internet and when it comes to the sort of general commentary on the internet, you can kind of categorize it in sort of two broad groups. There's the sort of more apocalyptic perspectives, people who say that the internet is making us more anxious, more disconnected, more isolated, more narcissistic and selfish. And then the utopians who say that the internet is making us more connected, more empathetic, um, more informed, um, helping us close vast expanses that we could never have closed before. 
And, I, you know, I think in the beginning of this process, I leaned more in a pessimistic direction. I was feeling more split in my own sort of digital life. Um, I think as I uh, learned a lot more over the last few years, I felt myself moving more toward the middle, toward people, you know, there's a sort of middle group of people who say, you know, the internet isn't going away, obviously. If anything, it's becoming more and more a part of the way that we understand who we are and forge connections and learn more about the world around us. And that has certainly proven to be true this last year in particular. Um, and so, you know, the folks in the middle sort of say it's not going away. And so we should try to learn how to live with it as best we can. And I felt myself moving more in that direction, but I actually would sort of say one additional thing on top of that, which is that I don't just think that the internet is a thing that we have to sort of learn how to live with and use well. I also think that the internet provides uh, an, a really valuable opportunity to sort of reapproach and reconsider age old questions about what it means to be human. Um, because we're in a moment of immense sort of cultural transition right now. We're moving from a pre-digital age to a digital one. And anytime we go through that sort of large cultural shift, um, it's, a pure, it's a tumultuous, challenging sort of uh, moment. Um, and, you know, we experience a great deal of loss in those moments, um, but there are also sort of new opportunities to go back to the drawing board and ask ourselves, um, you know, why we're doing the things we're doing. This is something I think many of my colleagues um, at Augsburg University where I teach had to do when the pandemic began. Um, folks who had taught offline classes for many years um, you know, some sort of tried to just basically take what they taught offline and sort of recreate it in a digital space. Um, whereas others said, you know, let me actually sort of take a step back and ask myself, you know, what exactly am I trying to offer when I teach this class? What kind of experience am I trying to um, to impart for the students and then how can I sort of go about doing that in this new way and in this new space and it gives you a chance to kind of re ask yourself. Um, things that maybe you had taken for granted, and I think the same thing happens as we sort of shift from a pre digital age to a digital one. Um, it's a it's an imperfect parallel, but it makes me think of sort of past moments of um, where we've had a, a kind of technological leap forward, like the, um, you know, when the printing press was introduced, um, you know, in many ways, the printing press was revolutionary when it came to spreading knowledge. Um, but it was a, a challenging transition in certain ways. I mean, for starters, um, sort of similar to what I was saying about um, cartography, you know, only a select few had access to printing presses in the beginning. And so they controlled what kind of knowledge got shared in that way um, and their interests were sort of prioritized. Furthermore, um, the, the sort of introduction of the written word or the printed word, um, you know, really changed the way that we share information. And in many ways, it made information much more accessible to a broader range of people, which is an, a very positive thing. But it also meant that you know, the, the sort of predominant way that knowledge was um, was shared before, which was orally, the kind of oral tradition of sharing, of sharing knowledge and stories, um, you know, that, uh, you know, there was the decline in that as a result. And when you share information in that way, it fosters, you know, a certain kind of relationship building, a certain kind of community experience that is lost when, you know, somebody instead receives the information from a printed book rather than directly person to person. And so for all of the sort of positives that came about as a result of that, there also was loss. And I think we feel that in our in this sort of pre-digital to digital shift that we're experiencing. We feel the loss of, of you know, what we can experience offline. Um, and, and, and yet, I think that as a whole, the opportunity to sort of re-ask these questions about what we need in order to feel like ourselves, um, I think, is, is really valuable. And so I guess before we, you know, transition um, to some questions and discussion, I want to share, I think, maybe five or so um, of, of the things that I learned while working on this book. You know, when I say that I think 
the this shift to a more digital age gives us a chance a chance to sort of ask important questions about what it means to be human and new. I want to share around five um, things that I learned from uh, five of those kinds of questions, um, and then we can get into discussion from there. So um, I think one of the ways that digital life presents a kind of a new or perhaps even unprecedented opportunity to reconsider essential questions about what it means to be human is that it makes us all amateurs. Um, so, you know, the internet is brand new. Um, it's, uh, it, you know, historically speaking, it's, it's, it's very new. And because the internet is so new, life online is for most of us a series of incredibly clumsy attempts at new ways of being human. You know, online, we're all kind of constantly trying things that maybe don't work or that we're not good at yet. Um, this definitely, Evan, connects to the conversation we were having before this session about sort of new ways of trying to build humanist community. We're all sort of trying and experimenting with different things right now. And a lot of them aren't going to go well um, because we don't really know what we're doing yet. And yet, I think in these new frequently inelegant ways of attempting to be human online, to find belonging, to find meaning, we can discover new and important things about ourselves. Um, I write in, in the book in IRL about um, in high school, a, a moment when my mom told me that I needed to go out for a, a sports team. <laughs> and um, this was my first year of high school. And I was not at all athletic as a child. Um, my three siblings were very athletic and I was much more interested in sort of bookish um, things. And, you know, prior to this moment, I had mostly stuck to the sort of hobbies and activities that I naturally excelled at, things that I was sort of drawn to myself and that I was, um, you know, a little bit better at. Um, and, you know, those were the things that sort of felt most rewarding and safest. And, and so I remember when my mom told me I had to go out for a sport, I, I protested, I, you know, I was like, you know, um, cause she said, I expect all of you are going to do this, you know, um, just like the rest of your siblings. And, you know, I said, well, it makes sense for them. They're naturally athletic. It's something they enjoy, but I, I just don't understand why this is something I'm expected to do, but she was resolute about it. And so I ended up um, deciding to try out for the cross country team because I was such a terrible runner. I just, um, it was a little bit of self-sabotage. I thought, okay, I'm gonna go out for this um, sport that I know I will be really terrible at and there's no way I'll make the team. But uh, what I didn't realize is that literally everyone makes the team in cross country tryouts. <laughs> and so um, that was truly was self-sabotage because I ended up making the cross country team. And, you know, I'll tell you, honestly, when I started, I was at the very, very back. Um, I was absolutely the worst. Um, but, and, and, you know, we all love a sort of um, a story of triumph. And so I'd love to say like, you know, and by the end of the season, I was in first place. And <laughs> that definitely wasn't the case. I was still pretty close to the back um, by the end, but I had definitely improved over the course of the season. Um, I, you know, I ended up getting actually the most improved award that year because I was really bad when I started. Um, and then uh, the next year um, I got most improved again. And I was never amazing at cross country, but I discovered a couple of things. One, I discovered I actually really loved running and it's something I have continued to do throughout my adulthood. And um, that I found to be a really helpful grounding sort of practice for me. But I also learned that you discover fundamentally sort of distinct things about yourself when you try something that you're actually not good at rather than kind of sticking to the things that come more naturally to you that it puts you in a position where you actually have to sort of have a very different kind of experience and thus learn different things about yourself than you would when you sort of stick to the things that you're already good at and I think online you know we're all sort of doing something I mean some of us are better at it some of us are worse at it um, but I think we're none of us are are great at it. None of us are up at the front of the pack. And so, um, you know, but I think that we, when, you know, we're having to sort of try something new that we're not good at yet, we get to learn really important things about who we are. Um, and I think there's a lot of value in it. It also makes me think of um, something I learned about while, while doing research for IRL. Um, I have a full chapter in the book, um, much like there's a chapter where I sort of draw parallels to cartography and map making. Um, there's another chapter where I, I draw parallels between our digital experience and uh, gameplay. 
So I interviewed game makers at a, a local uh, game um, company here in Minnesota. Um, I talked to gamers, um, people who had sort of spent a lot of time in online game space, um, exploring their identity and who they are. Um, I went to my first ever D&D meetup, which was tons of fun. <laughs> um, and I wanted to understand how, how gameplay is a space where we can sort of try out different aspects of who we are and, um, and adopt different sort of characteristics or bring very different characteristics maybe more to the forefront in a, in a sort of self-contained moment um, and, and experiment and ex, you know, with who we are and express different pieces of ourselves and, and sort of draw parallels between that and the ways that we can play with identity online and maybe sort of try out different things about who we are digitally. And um, when I was researching, um, I came across this idea of sort of deep play and shallow play. So in shallow play, that's kind of like when you're at a casino and you're, you know, sort of at the slot machine and you just keep pulling the lever, kind of hoping that you're gonna hit the jackpot. Um, whereas deep play is like the game, imagination games I would play with my siblings as a kid, where we created characters and storylines and developed really sort of entire universes. Um, and, and within those games, we could, um, you know, experiment with different ways of being and try out different sort of characteristics and and our relationships sort of grew deeper through those kinds of things um, and you know online i think we can play in both of those kinds of ways um, we've all experienced the kind of shallow play online where you know you're sort of you keep clicking and scrolling hoping for that sort of you know that rush of of engagement or connection and you're not really being super mindful about what you're doing um, versus the kind of deep play that we can experience online, um, where we can sort of, you know, experiment with who we are, uh, learn more about ourselves by doing things that, you know, we're sort of figuring out through trial and error. And, um, and near the end of working on IRL, I came across a really interesting study out of BYU um, that I found really helpful because there's this kind of common line of thinking again about digital life that the more time you spend online, the less happy you are. And we see these kinds of headlines cross our, our news feeds every day um, that the internet again is making you more miserable, more disconnected, more isolated. Um, but this study really challenges that line of thinking. And um, what's really helpful about it is that it was, an, it was an eight year longitudinal study. So over the course of eight years, they follow the same you know, people um, year after year and what one thing that they found in that study was that two people could spend the same exact amount of time online and have radically different experiences and that it all came down to sort of how intentional they were being about their internet use what they were using the internet for were they sort of driven by the algorithms to kind of keep clicking and scrolling and and not really being really mindful about what needs they were trying to meet when they logged on or were they using it in ways that were sort of deeply connective um, and and again i think this is why you know because the internet is so new and we haven't um really been encouraged to think of it as real life we have this idea that there's our sort of real life and then there's our digital life which is either sort of fake or less real than the other parts of our lives we're often not encouraged to think about it as mindfully as we do other parts of our lives. Um, but I think if we do, we can have a very different kind of experience online. So this leads me to the second thing that I want to share, which is that, um, you know, many people are leaving the institutions in which we've historically wrestled with questions of meaning and purpose, um, like religious spaces, and they're moving a lot of that work for, um, you know, the, the work of, of discerning who they are, of finding a sense of belonging and identity, they're moving it to the internet. Um, but many of the, those people, myself included at different points, think that you know, they're sort of rejecting the very idea of institutions and making their own kind of way in the world, um, that they're leaving behind. And, and you know, this, is, this transcends religion. We're really in a sort of anti-institutional anti moment culturally. So people are sort of um, not just leaving religious institutions, they're leaving political and civic ones, and they're sort of trying to move their search for meaning and purpose and, and identity um, to a more sort of individual and online experience. But the truth of the matter is that all we've really done actually is swapped out one kind of institution for another, because the internet is its own institution, 
with norms and conventions that are often invisible to us, often designed to be invisible to us. Um, and that these unseen you know, rules, um, they typically reflect the interests of power, um, like the invisible norms that, that often you know, guide cartographers in map making. And so you know, it's easy to sort of think that we've left institutions behind and are curating our own experience online um, but really, you know, these platforms uh, are have very particular ways and directions that they move us in. Um, and, you know, the truth of the matter is like climate change, um, you know, individual, it's not that individual behavior doesn't matter. Um, you know, it, it is, there, it's not um, unimportant that I be mindful of my own, um, you know, sort of the, my own relationship to the planet. You know, I can recycle, I can drive less, all things that I try to do. But as much as that has a very real impact on my own experience of life, it's not going to change things on a sort of systemic level. My individual behavior change alone doesn't change things on a systemic level. You know, it doesn't ultimately um, matter if I recycle more, if the sort of major corporations that are responsible for the majority of carbon output aren't sort of forced on a systemic level to change their practices. And likewise, the digital platforms that we increasingly use to, to express ourselves, to connect with one another, all these things that are really central to what it means to be a person. Until these platforms that you know are currently, we tend to think of the internet as public space, but it's actually not, it's private space. It's run by private corporations whose interests ultimately are in making themselves money. And so until they are sort of forced to change their practices, um, you know, it, the algorithms that sort of guide our digital lives are content neutral, you know, or some people call them agnostic, um, which is funny. But they, it, what that means really is that they don't really care what the content is as long as it sort of keeps users engaged. And so if the content that keeps people clicking and scrolling is, in tom is content that's inflammatory, um, you know, that that sort of upsets and enrages, then, you know, as long as it keeps people online, that's ultimately a win for the platforms. And so, you know, they don't necessarily have the best interests of individual users in mind. Um, and so, you know, we can we can change our own individual behavior and habits. And and you know, there's real value there. I found a lot of value in in trying to become more mindful about my digital habits, but until there's a kind of systemic transformation, it's it's not going to affect the kind of change that we really need to see if we want the internet to help us feel more human rather than less as it currently sometimes does, I think for a lot of us. The third um, takeaway that I wanna share is that I think digital life um, shows us quite clearly, sometimes more clearly than we would like or are comfortable with, the inherent contradictions in being human. Um, you know, the internet is both sort of permanent and fleeting all at once. You know, everything that we post online is sort of there forever and that can feel really intimidating and restricting. And yet also everything feels so sort of ephemeral online. You post something and, and within moments it's sort of gone down the timeline. Um, it's the internet is both a place where we can experiment and play with who we are and a place where we feel immense pressure to be coherent and consistent. Um, you know, one, one, um, one of the biggest challenges of the digital moment, I think, is that um, for all of human history, we've always been sort of complex beings um, who, you know, sort of change depending on the space we're in. So the person that I am right now in this presentation is different from the person I am when I'm with my mom or the person I am when I'm with my boyfriend or the person I am when I'm with my oldest friends. And it's not as if one of those is, you know, sort of the truest me and, and the rest are fake. I am a composite of all of those different selves. But one of the real challenges of the internet is that, you know, the self that we present to the world online needs to somehow be a self that can be seen by all of those different groups in our lives. Um, and so the way that we often respond to this sort of impossible challenge is that we reduce what we share, the, the self that we share online to the sort of safest version, the, the one that the sort of largest group of people will find acceptable. But I think we also have an opportunity to 
um, sort of embrace the chaos instead to say that actually what the internet reveals to us about ourselves is that we have always been these complex contradictory beings and rather than expecting ourselves and one another to somehow be these completely coherent individuals who are unchanging as we move from space to space in our lives, um, I think it gives us a chance to instead embrace the contradictions and tensions that make us who we are, to see that to be human is to be inconsistent, not to excuse those inconsistencies, but rather to recognize that that's part of how we come to better understand ourselves by exploring those things. And, and I think the internet gives us a chance to learn to become more comfortable with that reality. Um, you know, by calling into question what, what being real even means, I think digital life gives us the chance to explore the complexity of realness in a new way. And, and that's, I think, one real value of the fact that we live so much of our lives online now. The fourth thing I would offer is that I think that our digital attempts to find meaning and connection reveal to us that life is is inherently uncertain. Um, you know, I think one of the lines that we often hear about digital life is that, you know, the sort of more tools and platforms um, that we use, the more, you know, we can um, come to sort of know ourselves and the world around us. You know, I I can have a an I mean, I don't have one, but I could. I can have an Apple Watch that tells me exactly what my heart rate is and how many steps I've taken in any one day. And it's not as if this information is not helpful, but there is this idea often that we can kind of optimize our way to a sense of, of security and certainty. Um, but no matter how many apps that we use, we, we cannot sort of remove uncertainty from our lives. Um, and when we anxiously use these digital platforms to try to feel safe or secure or certain, then our digital actions will be sort of unreflective and reflexive and, and mindless. Um, it's sort of like, you know, in the moments when I feel lonely or bored, um, it's, it's sort of reflexive now to just reach for my phone and start scrolling. You know, my phone can very easily be the very first thing I look at in the morning and the very last thing before I close my eyes at night. It's really easy for me to never experience loneliness uh, now. And, um, and it's not that loneliness is, is good always or that we should you know, um, just force ourselves to experience it every time it arises, but loneliness and boredom contain data that, I, that can be really valuable. You know, I, I, I sort of grew up in this um, transitional moment where um, I didn't have the internet at home growing up. I have memories of biking to the library to use the, the you know, use a, a shared computer for 20 minutes um, before the timer expired and it was someone else's turn. Um, and so I have this, you know, and I didn't get my first smartphone until I was in my 20s. And, um, and so, you know, I can remember a life before sort of being constantly connected. I can remember sitting and waiting for a bus and just feeling bored out of my mind. And in moments of boredom um, and stillness and, you know, oftentimes uncomfortable emotions or, or feelings or recognitions can arise. Um, and, and so oftentimes, you know, we want to avoid boredom. We try to sort of make ourselves as busy as we can or um, feel as sort of, you know, plugged in or connected as we can in order to to distract ourselves from those feelings. Um, but oftentimes, you know, I can remember those moments of boredom when sometimes those uncomfortable recognitions would arise that oftentimes those were things that I actually needed to pay attention to. And if I didn't give myself the space to do so, I was, you know, missing really important information that would help me understand myself and the world around me better. And so, you know, I think that we, I took a three month social media sabbatical at the end of writing IRL, um, in part because I had a book to finish and I was, I just needed to really focus in on finishing it, but also because I was like, I've been exploring for years now how the internet is influencing what it means to be human, but I've been plugged in the whole time. And so I need to sort of, in order to sort of complete this, I feel like I need the experience of stepping away too. And I remember for the first, you know, first period of, of time after I, I did a sort of hard unplug, um, 
I felt like I was losing it. I mean, I, I was, uh, my friends started to point out that I was texting them in like meme format um, or tweet format. Um, I mean, I, I really went through withdrawal. Um, but then I started to feel um, amazing. I mean, I felt way less anxious, um, much more sort of content. And that would almost seem to suggest that this, you know, that this sort of common line of thinking is correct, right? That um, you know, being online makes us more anxious um, and, and that being offline would sort of be healthier and happier. But I started to recognize that actually it's kind of like going off on a meditation retreat or something. I mean, not, not for me because I find meditation retreats not relaxing when I've tried to do them, but, um, but it's, you know, it's, it's like going off on retreat. Um, yes, you feel more at peace, less anxious, but it's because you're, you're disconnected from the world because you're not confronted by other people's realities. And so, you know, it's, it's very easy to feel more at ease. Um, and so, and yet, you know, I think that in a moment when connection is the sort of norm, when it's easy to just reflexively sort of always reach for the phone, when connection is always just a kind of click away, we do have to be intentional about stepping back and taking time offline, not because life online is fake or less real than the other parts of our lives, but we, because we need the kind of perspective that we can only get when we're sort of truly alone, when we experience boredom and loneliness. Um, and, and, you know, in an age where sort of connection is the norm um, and the internet is sort of not less of a, a kind of thing, an intentional act that we sort of step into and out of, but more something that's kind of woven into uh, more and more a part of our lives. I think it's, it's worth being intentional about taking time away from that as well to get that, uh, that kind of perspective. I think that helps reveal us to ourselves. Um, and that, that I think leads to my final takeaway, which has been sort of laced in, I think, through all of this, which is, um, so I, I teach now at a Lutheran university, um, although it's a, it's a really interesting Lutheran university. Um, it's students are, the majority of the students are non-Lutheran. Um, in fact, it's a very high um, percentage of Muslim students. Uh, the neighborhood surrounding the university has the highest population of Somalians anywhere in the world outside of Somalia. And so there's a very large Muslim student population. There's a very large religiously unaffiliated population. And so it's this historically Lutheran university um, that has a, you know, a majority non-Lutheran student body. And yet because of its historic affiliation, it still has this religion requirement. So all students are required to take uh, religion 100, which is on religion and the search for meaning, and it tends to be, you know, take a more of a Christian lens. Um, and then uh, either they can take an elective religion class or they can take religion 200, which is religion and the search for meaning too. And so, you know, most students who are not religion majors and who are just sort of trying to meet their requirement um, end up taking religion 200. And that's the class that I teach. And um, I really enjoy teaching that class because it is a, a class that's specifically about providing a space for students to try to understand where they find meaning in their lives, um, whether it's, you know, through a religious lens or as is increasingly the case among our students through a non-religious lens. Um, but because I teach at a Lutheran university, many of my colleagues are Lutheran, Lutheranism is sort of in the air all around me, and it's hard not to think about Lutheranism sometimes. Um, and so as I was working on this book, I found myself thinking about something from the Lutheran theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with him, but he was alive in Germany at the time of the rise of, of Hitler. And um, uh, he had this, uh, this idea um, that you know, he felt really strongly that Christians should live as if there isn't a God. And what he meant by that is that Christians should work to discern the will of God and then act as God's agents in the world rather than expecting God to sort of intervene in human affairs for them. Um, and so what that meant for him was, you know, uh, he ended up participating in uh, an attempt to assassinate Hitler, which is why he was imprisoned, um, because he uh, so I and I think that's pretty badass, you know, um, but that, you know, his understanding of what God would want would be to assassinate Hitler is pretty cool. But um, 
but I, you know, I, I found myself thinking about this idea a lot, this idea, you know, that he, he felt Christians should try to live as if there is no God. And by the end of working on this book, you know, I didn't feel like I arrived at a sort of clear answer. Um, I, I think that the debate is going to rage on about whether or not the ways that we use the internet to understand ourselves, express ourselves, find community, you know, the, the, I don't think that I answered the debate about whether or not those things are as real as the ways that we do those things offline. But I think that whatever you think about life online, as real, as life offline, more real, um, less real, I think whatever you think of it, we would be wise to treat life online as if it is as real as the other parts of our lives, to work to try to bring the same values that we practice in other parts of our lives to the internet, to try to bring the same kind of reflectiveness that we bring to our other kinds of actions, um, our offline actions, to the things that we do online, the ways that we show up online, and to see the internet as a space that has really valuable information that can help us better understand ourselves and what it means to be a person, what it means to be in community. Um, you know, I think because we have, many of us have absorbed this idea, um, even if we're not aware of it, that life online is sort of fundamentally different from life offline, that is less real. Um, I think we often, you know, not only do we not bring the same kind of, um, you know, self-awareness that we would bring to other parts of our lives to the things we do online you know if you have a conflict with someone online it's easy to tell yourself well that you know that's not real life that doesn't really matter um and and yet i also think that this you know this has resulted in us not treating our digital lives as a space where we can come to better understand ourselves where we can look at our digital habits and practices as data um, that helps us better understand ourselves and what it means to be human that can teach us vital things about ourselves. And so I think whatever you think of life online, um, it, you know, thinking, treating it as if it is as real as every other part of your life, I think can, can help, you know, you learn more about who you are. Um, and I think there's a lot of value there. And so, you know, as I, as I sort of bring this to a close and we get ready to move into, um, into discussion, you know, I, I mentioned at the beginning that a, one of the reasons why I moved home back to Minnesota was to help um, take care of my stepdad. And I was really surprised um, how much my experiences, um, you know, I ended up, I, I, I spent several days a week with my stepdad over the last few years helping to take care of him. And I was not expecting that time to have as much of an influence on the book that I ended up writing as it did. Um, but and I think part of that is because you know people often talk about people who are living with Alzheimer's as um, even if they don't sort of say so overtly, they talk about them as if they are somehow sort of less real than other people. Um, you know, they're uh, you know as if they're not sort of. Um, I think uh, you know part of it is is because they they are going through a sort of. I mean, I watched my stepdad go through this sort of change, right? Who he was changed. Um, and I think a lot of people would look at him and say, well, he's not, he's not as real as he used to be, even if they wouldn't sort of come right out and say it. Um, but even though, you know, who he is, is very different, um, new things have emerged in him over the last few years. Um, you know, he and I ended up spending time together doing things that we never did before. Um, new sort of interests emerged in him. You know, we spent a lot of time going on walks, looking for animals, um, stuff that, you know, he, when prior to that, he was, you know, working all the time and, and didn't really have much time for, or interest in those kinds of things. And, you know, he was always a little bit more closed off. Um, and, and during the time that we spent together, he ended up opening up much more about his life, sharing all kinds of stories um, from his life. And, you know, the, the changes in him have presented many challenges, but, um, but also, you know, and, and there's been loss kind of, as I was saying about this sort of pre-digital to digital shift that we are experiencing, we've lost things in that shift to be sure, but there have been also new openings, um, opportunities to see things in a new way. And when I spent time with my stepdad, um, 
you know, I found myself having to really sort of slow down and pay close attention to him and to our surroundings, in part because he really needed me to. Um, but when that happened, you know, the sort of busyness of my Twitter timeline, um, all of that really sort of faded away. And I found myself able to notice things that I, you know, don't normally notice. Um, and, you know, at, as the same time as I was taking care of him, I read a really, really valuable book. Oh, it's actually right here. <laughs> um, I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's called This Life, um, Secular Faith and Spiritual Freedom by Martin Hagland. He's He teaches at Yale. Um, he's an atheist. And in the book, he makes the argument that, um, you know, for atheists, um, the most sort of important, precious thing that we have is time. You know, if this life is all that we have, then our time is the most valuable thing that we have and we should be able to spend it doing things that exploring, you know, these kinds of questions that, you know, about what makes our life meaningful. And, you know, in a time when our, our time can be very easily sort of monopolized by these platforms that are ultimately interested in keeping us clicking and scrolling, using sort of mindlessly rather than mindfully, taking our time back is sort of one of the most powerful things that we can do. Um, and, and that, you know, the time that I spent with my stepdad having to sort of slow down and pay attention um, really helped me sort of understand the importance of that. And so I guess in closing, I would just say that, you know, some of our greatest learning happens when these kinds of transitions happen. They're often painful, whether it's the transition that I experienced years ago that sort of helped start, you know, my journey toward working on this book or the transition that I, my relationship with my stepdad has undergone, um, you know, those moments of change can be immensely difficult. Um, but also some of our greatest learning happens at those places where things overlap and intersect and change. And at its best, I think this is what the internet fundamentally is about, about forging connections, about sort of, you know, where things overlap. But a lot of our greatest learning, you know, happens in those, um, in the sort of in between places of change and, and transition and and you know the internet itself is this sort of place where you know we're not just in this transition from a pre-digital age to a digital age the internet itself is this kind of place of transition where the real and the fake kind of mix and intermingle and i think in this sort of complex confusing space we can come to better understand these sort of age old questions about who we are, but we have to also recognize that, you know, this kind of transition is painful and challenging. Um, and I, again, I think this is something many of us have felt really acutely over the last year. I absolutely have. Um, but until we sort of lean into that and embrace that, we can't learn the lessons that digital life can, can reveal to us about who we are and, and what it means to be human. Um, and so, um, you know, I appreciate the opportunity to to get to share some of what my takeaways um, from the last few years have been, and I'm excited to hear your questions and and see what comes up for you. So, thanks very much. Thank you, Chris. Wonderful. Um, I've taken more notes from this talk than almost any speaker we've had in the past year. I, as an organizer, especially, this has been really wonderful for me. Um, yeah, if anyone has questions, please put them in the chat section and I will do my best to get some of those asked of Chris. I have my own list of questions here to get us started. Um, and then please check out his book. You can uh, find it on Amazon easily. I don't know if you have a preferred seller outside of Amazon you'd like to promote, but... Uh, I mean, I do prefer outside of Amazon if possible, um, but you can just go to irlbook.com and there's a bunch of links there. Um, to various places you can grab it, including Amazon. But, um, you know, I, I always suggest if you can to order it through your local independent bookstore because those places definitely need our support right now. Um, yeah. Wonderful. So to kick things off, I guess I'm gonna ask uh, kind of a technical question. Like what is, I don't know that we quite got a full definition of what you consider the internet when you say the internet. Cause I'm, sure. I'm kind of like, is it one place or is it multiple places? Uh, is there a metaphor you use to like describe what you're describing when you say the internet? Yeah, 
So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I sort of am using the internet as a shorthand for the social internet. So the places, you know, the kind of social platforms that we use to connect and express ourselves and organize. And so that looks like many things, right? It's Twitter, it's Facebook, it's Instagram. It's also forums and Discord and WhatsApp. Um, all these ways that we sort of digitally um, have digitally mediated relationships um, and, and also, you know, ways that we sort of broadcast and share a self with the world. Um, and, and, you know, particularly when digitally mediated. So, you know, when, uh, yeah, it, basically I'm using internet as a shorthand for social internet. But I mean, there's a lot of sort of individual self exploration and self building that happens online that's sort of not um, social, right? The, you know, the kind of Googling we do when we have symptoms uh, that we're trying to, which is, I don't recommend symptom Googling, but um, yeah, those kinds of things. And then there was another uh, kind of definition question. Someone was asking if uh, sitting with a book is some, you know, you, you were talking about boredom and loneliness and stepping away from the internet. Is sitting with a book similar, the same, or not fit in that definition? Yeah, I think it can be. I mean, I think it's different for everybody. I definitely found um, during the final year that I was working on IRL, um, I, mean, I was, I tried to do as much reading as I could over the course of all the years that I was working on IRL, but in the final year, I had to have three unexpected surgical procedures. And so I was spending a lot of time recovering from surgery. Um, and, uh, I ended up just spending a lot of time reading. Um, and I definitely noticed, and, you know, this was one thing I read up about a lot, the way that the internet has changed, um, various sort of human processes, um, whether it's, you know, our, our attention spans um, becoming more limited, which is something that a lot of people have experienced, or the effect of the internet on our memory, which is something that I explore in depth uh, in IRL, um, because these sort of real time, um, you know, for many of us, our, our social platforms function as these sort of real time um, documentation of our lives, you know, and, and as soon as we sort of post something online, um, you know, we're sort of storing our memories externally rather than internally. And in some ways that frees up more space for us. Um, but in other ways, uh, you know, we, we sort of lose the, the memory that we had because, you know, memories are something that change as we go back to them again and again. And when you go back to the sort of way that you've documented a memory online, repeatedly rather than going back to sort of your own memory of it that changes the way that you remember the experience and so um you know the the internet definitely has changed various um or, or had an impact on various sort of facets of who we are and i i found um regarding the attention span thing that um i almost you know i had to work I, I used growing up, I, I would read multiple books a week. Um, whereas I found, you know, I had this really large stack of books that I wanted to get through while working on IRL in order to um, get a better sense of the landscape um, of, of this issue. And uh, I just found that it took a lot more work. Um, so I, I'm not saying that uh, you have to get surgeries that you're not planning on in order to get through <laughs> Uh, books that you're trying to read, but I found it helpful for myself anyway. Yeah. I wanted to ask about your comment about institutions. So you, you kind of focused on this idea that we were moving some of our traditional institutions. Uh, you know, you started off by talking about religious institutions to kind of the internet and social internet as an institution, maybe other institutions where we used to rely on for, for truth, for vetting um, what was more true or not, or we kind of gave authority to certain ideas. Um, is, is that part of the problem though? If it's also like, there's this huge debate over truth right now and what is true or not. And as we are all now amateurs in a new institution, are we, you know, you mentioned at the very end of your talk, but are, are we, are we losing some element of truth? Will it be improved long term? Um, is this just we're in the chaos period to figure it out? But like, can we talk about truth and in institutions a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, it's a really important question. 
um, you know, what, the internet is incredibly freeing in a lot of ways. So like for much of human history, um, our, you know, where we find community and also what sort of truth we get was deter, you know, what stories we absorb about the world, about who we are, were determined by accident of birth, right? Um, your geography, your family of origin, Whereas now, you know, you can log online and find information and a sense of community. And that can be really freeing. I mean, the very first people that I ever came out to as queer were strangers online when I, you know, would bike to the library as an adolescent. And, and you know, at a time when I saw no other LGBT people around me, um, that was incredibly freeing. And also knowing that, um, you know, if I came out to someone online and it didn't go well, I could just close out of the window. But if I came out to my mom and that didn't go well, well, that would have all kinds of ramifications. And so, you know, the fact that we can sort of construct our own communities, our own little bubbles um, online, I think can be very freeing, especially for marginalized people um, who, you know, historically gatekeepers have sort of kept out of, you um, out of act, you know, out of power, and we see the ways that the internet is very powerfully used for all kinds of social movement building. Um, you know, the Arab Spring, Black Lives Matter, um, the ways that people create hashtags like hashtag disabled and cute to you know raise the visibility of communities whose stories have often been sort of kept out by various gatekeepers. The problems that arise, though, is that um, you know for as restricting as those communities could be, the communities of, of accident, of origin. Um, there's also something about sort of being locked into a community and being forced to kind of make your way through a conflict that can be really valuable. And when at the first moment of disagreement, you can just close out of a window, when someone tells you something that you don't wanna hear that, disagree, you know, that sort of contradicts your own view of the world, you can just sort of blo you know, block them and and find your own little sort of alternate news universe in online, this little pocket that, you know, tells you only what you want to hear. I think that, you know, there's real danger in that too. And so, um, and, and, you know, one of the real risks of this moment, this anti-institutional moment that we're in, you know, people are rejecting institutions that they very rightfully um, recognize as being more interested in preserving the institution than in truth, than in um, you know, in, in the well-being of individual members. And yet, um, you know, this sort of suspicion of gatekeepers also, you know, it's, it's like uh, skepticism is really valuable. And yet, like, skepticism can also be wielded in really harmful and damaging ways. And so, um, you know, I think we are navigating those realities right now. Um, the, the fact that what has been freeing for many people has also freed others up from um, accountability, from having to sort of be challenged. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I think that that's a thing that's going to have to get sorted out. And this is, again, where I think that systemic transformation is ultimately the most important thing. You know, I, I sort of build at the end of IRL to this idea that if there's sort of one if there's the, a sort of biggest stumbling block when it comes to harnessing the, hu the internet to become more fully human rather than feeling sort of less human online, it is the fact that we have this profit driven internet that is not, you know, that sort of poses itself as public space, but really ultimately isn't is private space and, and reflects the interests of the private corporations that run it. Um, and, you know, ultimately, we'll always prioritize what makes those uh, companies money, even if it comes at the expense of well be our well being, if it comes at the expense of, um, you know, if it undermines, uh, you know, people's ideas about what is true. Um, and, you know, you look at what are what are the most shared links on Facebook every week, and it's all of these, you know, incredibly untrue stories. And, um, and, you know, and I think that Facebook has a responsibility to, you um, you know, step in, but the ulti but ultimately they're not going to unless, um, you know, unless they're sort of made to. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, the, the kind of concerns over what is real online um, are, are very, very important. And that is, that's definitely, you know, one of the pieces that the book explores. Um, so thanks for that. Yeah, thanks for that. One of, one of the neat things about the internet argued more by probably tech utopists are the like this 
the speed that you can scale things. You can, you can create a Facebook in under five years that now touches a billion people, um, where in the real world, we've had much harder times getting institutions to that scale that quickly. I think I'd, be, I'd love for people to debunk me on that one. But um, you know, I'm, I'm intrigued by if you see any uh, cool models being tried right now or potentials for maybe breaking some of the uh, capitalist structures I think you're describing around the internet that will always create some type of uh, incentive gatekeepers. Um, you know, like I, is a Patreon or membership models kind of the way of the future or is that not possible the way we're currently structured? I don't know if you have any, any yeah. observations yet. I'm glad you mentioned the speed thing. Um, because yeah, I mean, in some ways, like I, I, at the beginning of the book, I say like, you know, in some ways you would expect like my position on the internet would be extremely sort of like pro internet, right? Because my career as a writer and a community builder, I owe all of it to the internet, right? I'm, you know, I, I was, I started a blog years ago that ended up connecting with an audience and that ultimately it was a big part of what led, you know, has led to pretty much every professional opportunity I've ever had. Um, I was a, a person because of my age, because of various things who often, you know, would not get to enter some of the kind of debates that I was a part of at the start of my career. Um, and yet, you know, and, and so I think you're right about the, the sort of speed piece, but one of the books I read, which I definitely commend to people while researching IRL was a book called Twitter and Tear Gas that looks at, um, the relationship between the, the social internet and social movements. And um, the author talks early in the book about, you know, sort of looking at the Arab Spring initially with a lot of excitement and enthusiasm and saying, look how, you know, this, this movement could sort of grow at a pace that would never have been possible before the internet. Um, and yet, you know, in just a couple of years, her optimism faded really considerably. Um, and, and one of the arguments she makes in the book is that, you know, yes, you can scale up really quickly online, but there's also something about the sort of messy, sticky work of movement building, the kind of relationships that you have to navigate, um, you know, the, the kind of slow work that happens in organizing that um, is lost online. And for as much as movements online, social movements can adapt really quickly, so can you know, the powerful, right? Um, if anything, they can adapt more quickly. And, and so, um, you know, you, you sort of built to like asking for a kind of tangible, like what are, what is, you know, what are the platforms? What is the future? You know, I unfortunately kind of like you suggested, I think until, until we see the kind of systemic transformation that's necessary, I'm just not sure that the internet um, can be, you know, I mean, I think the reality is that people are using the internet right now to, to, you know, forge and build community to, you know, and that social movements are sort of, you know, emerging online. But I also think that they reach a sort of, they often reach a kind of plateau, you know, a place where they can't really grow further because of the inherent restrictions of the internet right now. So I do ultimately think that, um, that kind of transformation is is going to be necessary. Um, yeah. And yeah, I mean, I, I I don't personally use things like you know Patreon. I've heard from some that it, it's a you know that's a great model. I've heard from others it's not. But ultimately, I think again, there are just some people are able to succeed, but it's more the exception than the norm right now. Right. Um, until there's a sort of greater tr systemic transformation. Yeah. I want to ask a little bit about discomfort. You spent a lot of time talking about discomfort and how uh, a lot of the internet is kind of structured right now for your comfort. Um, and uh, new ex you said new experiences is growth, um, but there's also this challenge of segment uh, segmentization, I never can say that word, and, capital and capitalism kind of cooked into these systems. So, I mean, while it sounds like if we can get deep experiences through the internet there is chance for discomfort and growth um but can we like there's so many algorithms baked into it these days and and how do we talk about those algorithms and what they mean and are we actually being so segmented that we're kind of getting 
uncomfortable discomfort. We're not actually getting diverse discomfort. Yeah. That, I mean, that is like a super important question. And it, it requires a kind of stepping outside of yourself that's in some ways might be impossible, you know, to ask yourself, am I really being made uncomfortable or am I being made uncomfortable in the ways that I'm comfortable with? Um, you know, we could, we could spend a long time on that one. But <laughs> I, I will say that, you know, there is reason for optimism. It's not as if sort of all is lost right now. One thing that I, I found really interesting and valuable um, when I was doing my research for IRL was, you know, sociologists talk about this idea of, um, of sort of strong ties and weak ties. So strong ties are people like, um, you know, not for everybody, obviously, but for many like family members or best friends, people who regardless of circumstance, you will find a way to keep in touch with. If, you know, if there's no internet and you're on opposite sides of the world, you're gonna be pen pals sending each other letters. You know, the, the, those are the people that you will keep in touch with no matter what. But then we have um, weak ties, which the majority of our relationships tend to be weak ties. So people who, you know, maybe you meet them once and your paths cross, but then you follow each other on Instagram and you're sort of staying each other's feeds um, from there forward. Or someone who, you know, maybe you're really close with for a short amount of time, but then you move and you go your separate ways. And, um, or, or even like, a, you know, someone, one of your friend's exes or uh, someone you, you know, met at a company party years ago or something. And these weak ties um, tend to, you know, our close ties tend to share a, a lot of our views. Again, not in every case, obviously, but, you know, we tend to become really close, closest friends with people whose worldviews are really similar to ours. Whereas weak ties are much more likely to um, have different, differing views than we do. And so, you know, one of the real values actually of social media is that can expand our network of weak ties. You know, you are much more likely through a weak tie to be exposed to something that, you know, you see that changes the way that you see the world, that challenges you. Um, you know, you might see, um, again, like your friend's ex who you, for some reason, Facebook friended years ago. And then, you know, um, they might share something on Facebook that pops into your feed that you wouldn't otherwise see. Um, and so, you know, for all the ways that, you know, these algorithmic bubbles certainly do exist, and it's really easy to kind of exist in a digital silo. Um, it's also very possible to connect to a much broader range of people and stay connected to a much broader range of people than you otherwise would. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's, you know, it's mm -hmm. not all hope is lost. Um, right. And I do think that the internet when harnessed well and when sort of run responsibly could, you know, this, uh, this ability to connect us to an ever broader range of weak ties, um, you know, can be harnessed to um, you know, contribute to this, the incredibly worthy goal that Carl Sagan talked about of, you know, the sort of ever expanding circle of who belongs, right? It sort of starts with the individual, then the family, then the sort of, you know, tribe, the nation, the world, right? And the human project has been the sort of ever expanding circle of who we see as being included. And, you know, the internet is, one, is the most powerfully connected tool we've ever had. Yeah. But um, you know, we we can have very different kinds of internets. We can have an internet that segments, that atomizes, that silos, or we can have an internet that connects, that opens us up to experiences we would never have otherwise encountered. And I think we've all experienced both kinds of internets. You know, I I have been connected to people online who I would never have met otherwise, and I tell some of those stories in the book. But I've also experienced you know, the internet that segments and silos too. And, and so, but I think the outcome is not set yet, um, but I think we have to demand the kind of internet that we want. It's not just gonna happen to be sure, right. especially left to again, the, you know, the companies that run the platforms then they'll, they'll prioritize their own interests ultimately. And I so appreciate that you started with cartography because I, I think that's such a good way to think about, you know, you're, you're born into, uh, families and often put in neighborhoods that are already segregated based on race or socioeconomic status to a point where you already were siloed and you already had um, bubbles. It was just, it wasn't, it was a different algorithm, right? It was, it was the powers that be IRL rather than online. Right. And, you know, that's, 
the thing that I came to recognize is that these various online phenomena, not, you know, very few of them are sort of brand new, right? Like we've always presented a curated self to the world. You know, before the internet, there was the family Christmas letter that doesn't, you know, I think I say this in the book, it doesn't mention dad's DUI, right? It's only talking about the highlights. And, you know, and we've always sort of mapped our world in various ways. Um, but, you know, I spent a lot of time when I was at the University of Minnesota's Map Library talking to um, the director of a project there called the Mapping Prejudice Project that maps racial covenants in Minneapolis and St. Paul. So these were clauses that were put in deeds of houses that said only, you know, white people could own this property. And, um, you know, this, you know, was a big part of what contributed to the neighborhoods in, in Minneapolis being segregated in the ways that they are. And so this is a sort of community driven effort to map those, um, those you know, racial covenants to sort of show what neighborhoods they were in and what they weren't and how that relates to the sort of demographic makeups of the neighborhood today. And, and you know, what that revealed to me was that these representations that we create of our world shape our world, right? And so it's not as if that the self that I'm representing online as influenced by the kind of conventions of these digital platforms has no sort of effect on me or on the world around me, right? These representations aren't just sort of representations, they help build the world around us and what we understand as being possible. Um, and, and, you know, again, because they're designed to be sort of invisible to us, these, these norms and conventions, um, it's critical that we, you know, I knew that my city was segregated, but I didn't know all the reasons why. I had no idea the role of racial covenants, for example, in shaping the city that I live in. Um, and, and understanding that helps me understand why you know, one neighborhood is resource rich and one neighborhood is a food desert. Um, so, yeah. Uh, we have a lot of good questions in the comments. I'm gonna try to get to a few real quick. Um, uh, someone was asking about how they have a father with dementia and would love any additional information, books, resources, groups, advice you might suggest. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, this last year has been very challenging, um, I think, for many people. My So my stepdad, um, we insurance eventually agreed to cover um, residential care for him. My mom and I were taking care of him together and it was it ultimately it became unsustainable. And we were really fortunate that um, the insurance company ultimately agreed to cover 100% um, of residential care for him. The, but the obviously we had no idea when in fall 2019, he, we helped him move into residential care that this pandemic was coming and, and um, you know, one of the absolute worst things for somebody living with Alzheimer's is to be socially isolated. And, um, you know, this, that's been a real challenge for, for him. Um, and, you know, he finds the um, things like uh, FaceTiming and stuff is, uh, you know, that's con more confusing than it is sort of helpful for him. Um, so, I'm not really sure that I have great advice right now. I just, I more share, um, I think for, for a lot of people who are Alzheimer's or dementia caregivers or a loved one of somebody who is living with Alzheimer's or dementia right now, I think um, it's, a, it's a particularly challenging moment in part because the social, the social piece is so critical or can be so critical for people living with Alzheimer's. And obviously we're in a moment right now where that's, um, you know, not possible. My stepdad did end up, um, did end up getting COVID um, in his residential facility. He recovered, um, which I'm very grateful for, but um, yeah, it's a, uh, I, I have definitely found, um, fellowship to be really helpful. Um, I have a couple of friends who, are you know also caring for a parent or a spouse um, who has Alzheimer's? One of my colleagues is caring for a spouse with Alzheimer's, and um, just having people that you can talk to about it. Um, I know that's like very very simple advice, but I found that to be essential for myself. 
So I wish I wish you well. There was a question about um, how people avoid sharing their most vulnerable or safest parts of their identity, whether that be out of fear of losing a job or talking about a mental illness or disease or tragedy, um, and how we make those kind of private things often because we're scared to share them online. At the same time, you talked about like the first place you came out was online. So maybe just a little bit more commentary on the safety of the internet and how that kind of goes to a larger vulnerability point. Yeah, I mean, the, the challenge, right, it sort of comes back to that thing I was saying about, you know, having to sort of be everything for all audiences online and the fact that there are real material risks, um, you know, to sharing certain things or to messing up on the tightrope that you walk online, you know, there's um, for as much as the internet can be a place to experiment, to go through trial and error, you know, um, it's also a place where every, it feels like everything's on the record all the time. Um, where, you know, whereas like a big part of how we grow as individuals is through trial and error and, you know, by making mistakes. And so, um, you know, one thing I learned, because I, again, I interviewed a ton of people while working on this book. And one thing I learned was having sort of private accounts is something that a lot of people find really helpful. Um, might be called like a Finsta or an alt Twitter, um, something that's not attached to your, your, you know, your photo or your, your government name or whatever, where you can express things that feel, um, you know, less safe to share in other parts of your life and how that can be really freeing in many ways. Um, you know, I know a lot of people who have gone online to, you know, sort of test the waters in some ways, um, you know, uh, try talking to a few people about something like one of the people that I talked to, um, you know, the internet was a really valuable space for her to be able to express and explore different aspects of her identity as a trans person, while she was still, you know, in the closet in other parts of offline parts of her life. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, I think it sort of comes back to the kind of like extreme dichotomies of our internet experience. Sometimes for some people, the internet can be the most freeing space they have um, to express things that they feel like they have no space for in other, any other part of their life. And yet, especially the profiles that are attached to our sort of, you know, our photos, our names, um, those can be the spaces where sometimes we feel, you know, the most sort of restricted in what we can or can't share. And um, yeah. I think oftentimes, you know, we sometimes police ourselves more than anyone else does. I mean, I, you know, one thing I talk about in IRL is feeling like this weight of responsibility in some ways as a kind of public person, um, especially someone who, you know, I spent a lot of years in my career advocating for atheists. And, um, you know, I, I was going on, like I went on the O'Reilly factor years ago to like, talk about atheism and um you know i remember i got this the invitation to go on the o'reilly factor last minute and i i talked to my mom i was like should i do this and she was like you know up to you but like it is an opportunity to speak directly to an audience who very rarely gets to hear from atheists and who's only you know most often hears about atheists from people who are portraying them in a negative light and so but anyway so i remember feeling like um you know pressure about like well what what can I share or not online? And is that going to negatively affect these things that I really care about? Um, and then I noticed over the years as I started to sort of, you know, let the walls down a little bit more, open up a little bit more, I expected there was going to be this huge sea change, things that felt really sort of radical for me and like no one else really seemed to notice <laughs> or care. Um, and so I think oftentimes we overthink our own sort of online output more than others actually really think about whether or not what we're sharing is sort of coherent or consistent. Um, so yeah, I mean, but again, we, you know, we all can think of examples of times when there are material consequences for people sharing things online. And, and so, again, I think we have a long ways to go to figure out sort of how to use the internet well in a way that, um, you know, that invites people to um, to grow, to change, um, you know, that not only allows space for that, but encourages it and yet also holds people accountable. You know, all of these things I think are really hard to navigate and they're hard enough to navigate in 
offline communities, you know, so I think, um, you know, it's not as if, again, this is a challenge that's exclusive to the internet, but I think the internet often, it brings, shines a light on how challenging those things can be to navigate, um, so. Ask one more question and then uh, we will take a pause, but I wanted to see if you think communities like ours, other secular communities, as we search for belonging, as we figure out how to build community, as we engage in activism, do we feel, should we feel pressure or ethical obligation to uh, build institutions or offer services that people are struggling with online and we think can be done better offline? Or do we think there's some hybrid model or should we actually be engaged in the internet way more based on your observations? Because let's say what we were just talking about, like I find that white people are really struggling with racial justice conversations and they would love like an in-person community group where it doesn't feel like everything they said can wind up back on social media. Um, and at the same time, if that becomes our only spaces, we're really only uh, a white discussion group at this point. Um, and so while that can be a human need, how do we manage that like how do we manage that need effectively and still build diverse, meaningful, belonging spaces? So I, I dropped a little complexity into that, but I don't know if you had any thoughts about like where we're going and our community's responsibilities. I mean, I think that, you know, to say that life online is just as real as life online is not to say that they're the same, right? Um, you know, it is as we are sort of going through this big cultural shift, there's change, there's loss, you know, certain things that, that we can only experience offline, you know, we we're, we sort of lose when we move things into digital space. And so, I mean, I think that the answer is that both are really valuable, just as you need time, you know, to be connected, you also need to step away sometimes. Um, and, and so, you know, I think ultimately the best, you know, the best communities are ones that recognize that people have a constellation of needs, some of which maybe can be better met online, some of which, you know, are better met offline. Obviously, in this specific moment, we're very limited because of the pandemic. And so, you know, there are certain things that we cannot do um, safely or in good conscience. Um, but uh, that doesn't mean that, you know, in, in an ideal future, we won't be able to sort of offer both. Um, and recognizing, right, like there are, again, uh, there are things about online experiences that are really valuable that offline experiences can't offer. You know, they, they reduce the barriers for a lot of people, whether it's someone who feels like it's not safe for them to sort of show up um, and, and have their identity known because they're just sort of tiptoeing into like some of the questions like, am I an atheist or that sort of thing? And what will the people around me think if, if that information comes out? And so, you know, a virtual event where they can more anonymously sort of participate can be really valuable. People living with certain disabilities, um, virtual events are much more accessible. Um, you know, at the same time, uh, having taught both in the classroom and virtually, you know, I know that, um, you know, there are certain things I can do in a classroom that I can't do in virtual space, certain ways that I can help students be engaged, especially students with varying, you know, learning disabilities, um, you know, where we, we just have a harder time doing that online. And so, you know, I, I hate to say, like, it, it's, it's, it's too easy in some ways to just say, like, well, do both, because that's not always going to be possible. Um, and certainly, like, when it comes to like a program like this, you know, you're in in a non-pandemic world, you know, you're not going to have this a virtual event and an offline event. You're just on a capacity level, like you maybe can't do both. You can maybe stream your virtual event or your your offline event to the internet, but it's you know you're not doing sort of two discrete events. But um, I think again, this sort of comes back to the kind of some of the, a lot of what I said throughout the talk and especially at the beginning, I think being forced by the fact that so much of who we are is now sort of expressed and, and found and shaped online. I think it does force us to kind of go back to the drawing board a little bit and say, you know, and this is a big part of what we were trying to study with this, this survey on the lives of the religiously unaffiliated, which we'll definitely be sharing our findings. So 
stay tuned for that. Um, we're gonna hopefully have produce a report with some suggestions based on what we found for people who are trying to build community for non-religious people to say like, these are some of the things that we found that the population is looking for. But I think that, you know, being forced to kind of go back to the drawing board and ask yourself like, okay, what, you know, rather than saying like, let's just take this program that we did offline and try to sort of recreate it digitally say like, well, what experience do we want people to have? And how can we go about meeting that experience in this new format? And what are some of those sort of new opportunities that this digital format avails um, that maybe aren't possible offline? Um, so yeah, I mean, that's sort of a long way of saying like, I think there's pros and cons, I think there's value in both, but like, yeah, I think in an ideal future, you are doing both and, and recognizing that, you know, both have very particular strengths to offer. Wonderful. Well, thank you again for speaking to us uh, virtually. We hope someday we can fly you to California again for a talk. I was actually um, I was supposed to be in LA. Um, it was the, the week in March when like everything locked down. I was supposed to fly to LA that week. Um, and then I was also supposed to be back in LA the week that IRL came out. Um, I was going to officiate a wedding. I don't know if any of you listened to Oh No, Ross and Carrie. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. We've hosted Ross a few times. Yeah, so I was supposed to officiate Carrie's wedding that week. Um, and I was going to do a, a book event and all that. So all that to say is uh, the pandemic has now taken two LA trips from me. And so I will definitely be looking forward to returning to LA and I'll make sure to let you know. And yeah, I we'd love to host you then. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you again. Um, we are down to only one in-person event in our community these days. So uh, real quickly, I just wanted to, if anyone's looking for opportunities to do our one in-person event, we are volunteering with the LA Food Bank. Uh, we are now hosting the food bank on our property. Uh, we use our parking lot and we usually have about 20 volunteers and hand out about one to 2,000 pounds of food. Uh, we are always looking for volunteers for that program and we are looking for donations. Um, it's now our largest event and it is growing by the month. We are getting overwhelmed by the amount of people that need food and the amount of efficiency we've made with our program. So please come out and help us with that or uh, send a donation of support. And then some other in-person events we're hoping to get back up and running again soon. Uh, we're doing a socially distanced drum circle uh, with a local uh, djembe drum expert um, and some other cool things, yeah. Thank you again, Chris, uh, for all of you attending. I'm going to turn off the live stream now. We can hang out for a few more minutes. Um, Thank you.